My name is Maka Kama and I'm calling in from Ngunnawal land in the great nation of Australia. And I wish to echo the acknowledgement of traditional owners of country throughout Australia, New Zealand and across the oceans of the South Pacific, including their continuing connection to land and water, the oceans and the community. I also extend my respect to all Indigenous people in attendance today from wherever you're calling in from across the world for today's GAP Summit on Shared Identity. Tongan writer and anthropologist Epeli Haofa provides the context within which today's summit is juxtaposed. He describes the notion of being a Pacific Islander as a common identity that would help us act together for the advancement of our collective interests and for the general good. Whilst the many members of the diverse and island nations of the Pacific retain a fervent pride in their specific national heritage, there's an undoubted common thread between all island descendants, regardless of the island. Pacific Islanders share similar stories, common beliefs, ancient traditions and deep familial structures. We come from all walks of life, from the stereotypical to the fantastical, with many islanders bringing our own island flavor to the rest of the world with great success. Our shared ocean identity is both our common connector and at the same time, our greatest existential threat. Now, more than ever, the islands need the assistance of its perennial allies in Australia and New Zealand and across the world to help transcend these major challenges and overcome these rising tides. As an Australian of Tongan descent, my parents raised me and my siblings in Bathurst, a small country town in New South Wales, Australia. And whilst I had many fond memories of my hometown, I did experience significant racism and prejudice which reinforced an underlying feeling that I never truly belonged. However, every now and then I would pass by a visiting Pacific Islander in the town and in the street we would, for whatever reason, uh, utter and rehearse the welcome words, uh, hey bro. And in those short moments, I felt more connection with a complete stranger than I did with the people that I'd grown up with my entire life. It sounds really weird, but Pacific Island culture can find a way just to make you feel like you can really belong. As the governor of Bathurst Jail, my late father, Jim Karma, set quite an imposing figure, not just over the prisoners inside the jail, but to anyone else in the local community that wasn't quite doing the right thing. He possessed an undeniable physical presence as a natural result of his specific heritage, but he also equipped himself with the Bachelor of Criminology, from Charles Sturt University in Bathurst, which formed the foundation of his rise up the ranks of the New South Wales Corrective Services right to the very top. In this way, my father showed me that education was the key, and I understood very early on the value of a solid education for Pacific Islanders to be successful in their career. My father, Jim, was an amazing role model for me, and he showed me that this is an example of what's possible for my own future as a Pacific Island le leader in Australia. And in the late 90s, my father was promoted to governor of Sydney's Park Lee Correctional Centre. And at the time, the then Blacktown Mayor, Charlie Knowles, and the local member, Skills Minister, Ed Husick, asked Governor Karma to create a much needed community diversionary program for youth at nearby Mount Druitt, which was notorious for its high levels of youth crime in Western Sydney. Governor Karma believed that education was the key and that all these kids needed a way to try and find a different way to try and see how they could just finish their homework. And so what he did was he opened the homework center, which was basically a Hyde community hall, a donated barbecue from Bunnings, sausages and bread from Woolworths, and a group of local Western, University, Western Sydney University students and parents that came together to help kindergarten all the way up to year 12 Mount Druitt students just to finish their homework. Because as long as they were doing that, they weren't running the streets, getting up to trouble. And in the homework centre, kids could spend more time with their parents and they'd be able to socialise with the other parents as well. And those kids would be introduced to local leaders who were examples of what they could become one day. And after completing their homework, they would participate in group activities, learning all about the various cultures from which they came from and which they descended. They could reconnect with their heritage and remind them from where they came from. You see, the challenge for a lot of these kids is that they 
unfortunately had many of the odds stacked against them just because they were born in a particular place or the color of their skin or the friends that they had growing up. Along with many others, they found themselves on the wrong side of what is known today as the digital divide, a division causing large parts of the population to miss out on access, education, training, and the opportunities to master the arts of these important digital skills. And the research, it really shows a significant amount of digital exclusion for our First Nations people, people living in rural areas, low-income households, aged Australians, people with disabilities, new migrants and refugees. And as a budding technologist, I learned firsthand about these challenges and set myself out on a mission to try and use technology and inspire leaders to try and find ways to help these underprivileged people. So I took my education and data and my experience in law and I went and worked straight for government to try and see if I could figure out how to take the effects of the homework center and roll this out at large scale. And along the way, I ended up working for a federal attorney general's department of a, of a minister who's on this call today. Uh, I worked for the Department of Health and Aging to find ways to scale large digital transformation projects. And throughout that time, I found myself working for various multinational IT consultancies serving the government, delivering large scale projects and amplifying the positive effects of technology for the benefit of Australia's underprivileged people. And working for these companies, it opened my eyes to the way in which leading IT companies can use their success to give back to the community. And it's been a privilege to be able to work for these organisations, none more so than DXC. I joined DXC because of its social impact practice comprised of programs that focus particularly in areas of society where people often find themselves on the wrong side of the digital divide. DXC has created the Dandelion Program for neurodiverse folks, the Indigenous Programs for Australia's First Nations people and Maori and Pacifica people, so that they can be digitally equipped with co-designed education, business, employment and community initiatives and the Veterans Program which helps veterans find a way to use their highly attuned outcomes-driven skills to good use in the IT industry. DXC is also developing new social impact practices for women, a talent academy and a digital futures program. As a result, I think that DXC has created a significant impact, not just for itself and its own employees, but also for its customers and members of the community to help them build their own social impact practices. This is a very direct example of the way that DXC has taken all of its lessons and learnings and impacted society in a positive fashion, but we must do more. At the recent Job Skills Summit hosted by Federal Minister Ed Husick, we set ourselves some key actions to uplift skills and job opportunities for the nation. We agreed that we needed to build bigger and better workforces we needed to embed women's economic participation and equality as a key imperative. And we needed to reduce these barriers to employment and the advancement so that all Australians could benefit from a strong economy. However, we are asking vulnerable people from the regions to uproot themselves and move to metropolitan centres just to get work. And once again, even though they might become members of those productive areas within which they now live, often the benefit doesn't make its way back to the regions. So for everybody in attendance today, I want you to know that I have a clear vision where we can find ways to use significant technology advances and infrastructure and together create remote indigenous and Pacific technology workforces. I can see a Darwin Aboriginal coding development center. I believe there's now a cybersecurity center in Bathurst, perhaps we can create a Tahitian testing center. And in Suva, I'm certain we can create an IT managed services center. And at these locations, we can establish new homework centers connected to each one of these centers supported by government, private enterprise and local community groups that will work together to make this vision a reality. And with this in mind, I call on all the delegates in attendance today to undertake immediate action for businesses. If you don't already have one, I strongly recommend you create a social impact practice of your own. For governments, please find a way to make this vision a reality and help fund the infrastructure and drive the political 
political goodwill to achieve what's required. And for citizens, it's really important to remember where you came from. Don't feel disillusioned or despair. It's time for us to really hold on to that optimism make sure that we can do more to try and achieve this vision because there are absolutely organizations out there focused on much more than just economic benefit that have a heart and want to find ways to help our most vulnerable and underprivileged people to be able to grow societies where they are through digital transformation in conclusion i wish to leave you with the words of epele how offer that in order to give substance to a common regional identity and animate it we must tie history and culture to empirical reality and practical action. I truly believe that with such strong representation from key stakeholders uh, in attendance in today's call, we can achieve significant action towards empowering our region's underprivileged peoples by creating digital pathways, homework centers, and centers of delivery and help them transcend the digital divide. Thank you.